Hey guys, this video is about Gibbs free energy, G. So remember, um, we saw earlier that in order for a process to happen spontaneously, the entropy of the universe must increase. Now remember, we have the system, we have the surroundings, and then everything is the universe. So overall, in the universe, in its entirety, for something to happen spontaneously, entropy in the universe must increase. And that can happen sometimes if the entropy of the system decreases, um, depending upon relative magnitudes of the entropy changes. So the delta S of the universe is equal to the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings, and that has to be positive for something to happen spontaneously. Um, now, because the, the mechanism, it ends up, so it ends up that the, the, the mechanism, the means by which entropy um, is transferred between the system and the surroundings is through the transfer of thermal energy. Um, so at constant pressure, that's Q. Um, well, that is Q, and at constant pressure, that is our delta H of the system. And so because the entropy of the surroundings has, the, the change in entropy of the surroundings has the opposite sign of um, what happens in the system. If the system, if its delta H is positive, that means that this is an endothermic process and the system is gaining thermal energy, which means that the surroundings are losing entropy. This equation here is pretty important, guys. On the other hand, if a process is exothermic, then that means that the, um, the process releases thermal energy. Delta H is negative. Negative times a negative is a positive. The, this, this T here is absolute temperature in Kelvin, so it's positive, which means that if for an exothermic process, the change in entropy of the surroundings will be positive. Now, keep in mind, the important thing is the change in entropy of the universe, right? But what this does for us, you'll see, guys, is it gets us um, information about the surroundings by studying the system, which is really nice because the surroundings are huge. It's the rest of the universe, right? But the system is something manageable. It's our experiment. So plugging this in to our delta S of the universe equation, we see that the change in entropy of the universe is delta S of the system minus delta H of the system over the temperature. And for something to be spontaneous, that must be positive. If we um, multiply through by negative T, right, it ends up that, you know, the negative T comes through over here. We get negative T delta S of the universe is equal to positive delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system. The reason we did this is this guy named Josiah Gibbs, um, brilliant, brilliant guy, um, defined a function for us called Gibbs free energy. He defined this function, G, as being equal to H enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy. And the reason he did, you'll see, this is a very, very nice definition for us. Um, what, okay, first of all, we see that if G is equal to H minus TS, then delta G is delta H minus T delta S. We're going to assume isothermal and isobaric conditions here. That means the temperature doesn't change and the pressure doesn't change. That's why the temperature is not within the delta sign, it's constant. Um, and these are delta H of the system and delta S of the system over here. So we have a function, uh, delta G, well, G, and delta G is delta H minus T delta S. Very important equation, guys, right here. Write that down, memorize it, we use it quite a bit. It's real useful. So now we have a useful means of determining spontane spontaneity, a criterion for spontaneity, um, as well as, you will see in, in a little bit, equilibrium. That is whether or not the system's at equilibrium, and if it's not, which way it'll go. Um, so because, remember, delta G was equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system, and this is also equal to minus T delta S of the universe. Now remember, for still, still the same um, test, right? For something to be spontaneous, the entropy of the universe must increase. That means delta S of the universe is positive, negative T delta S of the universe is negative, delta G has to be negative. So if delta G is less than zero, 
we know a process is spontaneous. If delta G is positive, that means that delta S in the universe is negative, and that's not a spontaneous process. And this is a condition of equilibrium. This could be useful too, guys. If delta G is equal to zero, then that system is at equilibrium. The process is at equilibrium. And so these are all the possibilities in this little table here, right? And what we're doing is looking at a couple things. One, the sign of rel well, the sign of delta H and delta, delta S, the system, and how they affect, affect the spontaneity, and also how the temperature can, under certain conditions, for, for certain processes, um, affect the spontaneity. It can be spontaneous at some temperatures and not spontaneous at other temperatures. So let's, let's go through this real quick. So if delta F H here is a negative number, okay, remember, remember, we want for spontaneity, we want delta G to be negative. Delta H is negative, that means that, and, and if delta S is positive, then this is a negative, this is negative, and delta G is always going to be negative. That process is always spontaneous no matter what the temperature. Okay, that's nice. Now, if delta H is positive, okay, and delta S is negative, that means that um, negative T delta S is a positive number. Um, Delta H is a positive number, and no matter what the temperature, overall delta G is a positive number, and that process will never be spontaneous. It's always a non-spontaneous process. These are just some examples over here. Now, here, here is where it gets interesting. So if delta H is negative, but delta S of the system is negative, that means we have a positive term here and a negative term here, and whichever is bigger is going to dominate. If this term here, T delta S, is um, smaller than our delta H term, then if the delta H term is larger than the T delta S term, we will have negative delta G. It'll be spontaneous, and that's going to be at lower temperatures. You see, as we increase the temperature, as the temperature increases, this term becomes larger and larger, and at one point it will overpower the delta H, being which is negative, and this positive term will be larger than delta H, and we will get a positive delta G, and it will be non-spontaneous. And you guys will see, in a few minutes, we can calculate pretty easily what temperature that happens when it goes from being spontaneous to non-spontaneous. Um, that will be the equilibrium temperature, temperature which is equi at equilibrium. Um, and now if both of the terms are positive, um, this is a positive term, delta S is a, a positive term, then this now is negative, the negative T delta S of the system is a negative term. And if this is larger than delta S, this will be a spontaneous process because delta G will be negative. And that means that when T is larger, this term will start to dominate and will have a spontaneous process. So under those conditions, positive delta S and positive delta H, higher temperatures favor um, spontaneity, lower temperatures not. And it's the opposite for um, negative and negative. The other thing here now, this is this is a, a import, an important fact down here. Um, we already know from um, before that enthalpy, temperature, and entropy are all state functions. That is, they do not de depend upon how they got where they are, just where they are at the time. Um, and that means that delta H, and delta T, and delta S all depend only upon the initial and final states and not the path that they took to get from the initial to the final state. Because delta, because G is comprised of H, T, and S, you know, Gibbs free energy is equal to um, H minus T, S, then we see that Gibbs free energy is also a state function. And that we love. That's a nice thing. It means delta G is also um, a state function. depends only upon the initial and final states. And that means we can do all kinds of fun things with it. Okay, so here's our first example, guys. Um, we're told that this reaction here is spontaneous below 1,950 degrees Celsius and not spontaneous above 1,950 um, degrees Celsius. So that means it goes from being spontaneous below 1,950 Celsius at, to non-spontaneous above. That means at 1,950 Celsius is our equilibrium point. So we want to find the standard molar entropy of iron 3 oxide. This is a balanced equation. 
um, given this information down here. We're given the heat of formation of iron three oxide, hydroxide, excuse me, um, heat of formation of liquid water right here. Um, we're not given the heats of formation of iron or oxygen because we don't need them because we know from Chem 101 that the heat of formation of an element in its standard state, which solid iron is and gaseous oxygen is, is zero. So, zero. And we're also given the entropies of the iron, the oxygen, um, and the water. And what we want to do is, with those standard entropies, we're going to find the standard molar entropy of iron three ox hydroxide. All right, so before we work it out, um, because we know delta G0 of the reaction is negative below 1950 and positive above 1950, that means at 1950 degrees Celsius, delta G0 of the reaction must be equal to 2000, you know, which is, you know, converted to Kelvin at 273.15, 2223.15 Kelvin. So that's where delta G equal zero is equal to zero. We also know that delta G0 of the reaction is equal to delta H of reaction minus T delta S. These little superscript zeros um, just mean standard conditions, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Don't worry about that for now. So, given this information, we have enough right here on this page to find the standard molar entropy of iron three hydroxide. So, I want you guys to see if you can work this out, and you know, pause the video, and then come on back when you get your answer. Welcome back, guys. So, here we go. There's the reaction. Um, this is what we know. So because we know delta G0 is equal to zero, this is zero, we can see that delta H reaction minus T delta S reaction is equal to zero, or rearranging delta H of the reaction is equal to T delta S of the reaction. Now here, reaction is the system, so this is the delta H of the system, same thing. So, <clears throat> and we can get delta H because we just use Hess's law from Chem 101. Um, products minus reactants each times their coefficient in the balanced equation. So four times the standard um, heat of formation of um, iron three hydroxide minus six times the standard heat of formation of liquid water. And remember, oxygen, gaseous oxygen and solid iron are both zero, so we don't have to use those. And we see that the delta H of this reaction is negative 1582 kilojoules per mole, an exothermic process. We can get delta S of the reaction <clears throat> from this equation right here. Okay. Now, you have to be really careful with these subscripts, guys. We saw earlier that delta S of the surroundings is equal to negative delta H of the system over T. But this is not the surroundings, so that's why we're, we don't have a sign here, right? Don't have a negative sign here because this is not the same equation. This says that the delta S of the system or the reaction is equal to a positive delta H of the reaction or system over T. And we just found delta H for the reaction, so we can get delta S of the reaction. There's our temperature in Kelvin. Make that the same color. Um, and we see that the delta S of the reaction is negative um, 0.71169 kilojoules per Kelvin mole, kilojoules per Kelvin mole, which converting it to joules by multiplying by 1,000 joules per kilojoule gives us negative 711.69 joules per Kelvin mole. So it's a negative delta S for the system, right? So now to get the delta, um, the entropy, the standard molar entropy of the iron three hydroxide, which is what our goal is, is we write out the delta S of the reaction as being equal to four times the entropy of the product, well, the product times its coefficient, right? So four times the entropy of iron three hydroxide minus um, four times the entropy of iron, three times the entropy of oxygen is six times the entropy of liquid water. Um, so rearranging this equation to solve for what we want, the entropy, the standard molar entropy of the iron three hydroxide, it looks like this right here. Plugging in these numbers, which we were given on the previous page, we can plug in, um, we got our delta S of the reaction right up here, uh, where is it, right here. That goes right there. And we see that what we tried to find, the standard molar entropy of the iron three hydroxide is about 108 joules per Kelvin mole. Now, okay, so here's, here's that, that superscript zero that you guys, um, or O rather, that you guys were um, seeing floating around a minute ago. Um, the G zero of reaction, or read that zero for um, applied to any, any function really, um, means that that's, um, 
um, at under what we call standard standard state conditions. Um, and this is actually not. Let me change this real quick just to be sure. So G zero is not the change. It's is the it's the excuse me is just the Gibbs free energy. Okay, so that's fixed. Um, but the, the point is that the superscript lowercase o, that, that means standard state conditions. And here is what they are. For a gas, that means all the gases are at pressure of one atmosphere. Liquids, they're all pure liquids. Nothing else is in them. Same thing for solids. For it's an, for, if it's an element, that means it's in its, in its most stable state, in its most stable allotrope that exists at one atmosphere and 25 Celsius. For example, like carbon. We know carbon can exist as... Um, well, diamond, uh, graphite, um, um, Buckminster fullerene, all, you know, all kinds of, a few different allotropes. And graphite is the most stable allotrope, so that's the standard state for carbon, for example. Um, and then a solution, everything is one molar. Now, this is, this is never, almost, <laughs> very, very rarely the case, okay? In, uh, in the lab, in real life, in experiments, we don't have these conditions, but what this is good for, the standard states, is comparing different substances, for example. When I look at the delta G of a reaction under standard states, we can compare two different reactions and see which one is, um, you know, has a more negative or more positive, for example, delta G under standard states, and then we can infer things about that based on the standard states. It's something that we can tabulate. It makes, you know, we can't tabulate um, you'll see delta G for all react, you know, for a bunch of reactions because it depends, right? What value delta G has depends on ends up the temperature and the concentrations or pressures of everything there. But this we can. So another one way, you guys, of calculating delta G zero of a reaction is just basically Hess's law, but for Gibbs free energy, and it's the products minus the reactants each multiplied by their coefficient in the balanced equation. So all the products, the, the delta G of formation, so this F, guys, this stands for the change in Gibbs free energy under standard state conditions for the formation of each of the products, and the same thing for the reactants. And these are things we can look up, okay? These are numbers that are in tables, we didn't look, to look them up. Um, and these, the N stands for the coefficients in the balanced equation for products, M for the reactants. Now, difference between delta G and delta G zero. It is delta G that determines whether or not something's spontaneous um, under the, the, the specific conditions that we're doing our reaction at. Um, you'll see that um, sometimes delta G can be positive and delta, and delta G zero negative and vice versa, or they can both be the same sign. It depends. Um, so one thing that the delta G, not delta G zero, depends upon is the temperature. Right? We'll see that. Um, another thing, okay, so relating this to equilibrium. Back when we talked about equilibrium, we're going to get an equation in a little bit that actually relates delta G, um, and, well, and delta G zero, and K, the equilibrium constant. So remember, back in the equilibrium module, we said that if Q is less than K, um, it's going to shift to the right. If Q is less than K, it'll shift to the left, and Q equals to K means that we're at equilibrium. We're going to see how that relates to delta G in a few minutes. Um, so, you know, the um, the the um, analogy with delta G is that if we have a large negative value of delta G, that means that the equilibrium favors a product. So, under those conditions, it's going to shift to the right to come to equilibrium. If it's a large positive delta G, that means that it's going to shift to the left. The reactants are favored. All right, so. Here's another example, guys. So we're given a balanced chemical equation, the decomposition of potassium chlorate to make potassium perchlorate and potassium chlorate. Um, and we want to find um, delta G zero for the reaction. So we're going to use the given, we're given these, um, the delta G zero formation, the change in Gibbs free energy under standard state conditions for the formation for um, the reactant and the two products. So basically, we're just plugging into that equation that looks like Hess's law. 
So why don't you guys do that real quick and come on back when you get your answer. Welcome back, guys. So <clears throat> there's our equation, products minus reactants. So pretty really much just plugging in three times the delta G of formation of potassium perchlorate, which is this, um, three moles. Let's look at the units here. Three moles times that many kilojoules per mole plus one mole of potassium chloride times that many kilojoules per mole minus the reactant, which is just one, four moles times its delta G of formation. And it ends up when we plug these numbers in, we get negative 134 or so kilojoules. So that tells us that um, under standard conditions anyway, standard state conditions, the products are favored and, and this will happen until we come to equilibrium. All right, so next we have another very useful equation. See this one up here, right, right here, guys? Um, write that down. We, we use that, um, and we, we get a few other equations from it. Um, I'm not going to drive it for you. Um, this is if your chem major get into physical chemistry, like your third year or so, that's where we drive that. But it's real useful, so we're just going to give it to you guys for free. Here it is. This says that delta G for a process, which is the thing that determines spontaneity under those conditions, is equal to delta G zero, something we can either look up or calculate pretty easily from the delta G formations, plus our good old favorite constant R, um, gas constant 8.3145 joules per Kelvin mole, times the temperature in Kelvin, RT, natural log of the reaction quotient. Remember this from the equilibrium module? Remember the reaction quotient Q looks exactly like the equilibrium constant, except it's not necessarily at equilibrium. Um, and Q, if we're talking all gases, can be either in, can be um, QP, which is everything's in partial pressures, or if it's um, in concentrations, we can also do concentrations. So <clears throat> what this does for us is it lets us calculate if we know the temperature and we can find or calculate the delta G zero for that reaction under the, the specific conditions of our reaction, the temperature and Q concentrations or pressures, we can determine the value for the, the important thing, delta G, which tells us if it's gonna be spontaneous or not or which way it's gonna to go to achieve equilibrium. So let's look at this simple equation here. This is just hydrogen gas and iodine gas in equilibrium with hydrogen iodide gas. Um, so Q in terms of partial pressures would be just be, you know, products of reactants, partial pressure of hydrogen iodide squared divided by the partial pressure of hydrogen times the partial pressure of iodine. And we're given this. So we calculated this probably from the delta G zero formations. Delta G zero is equal to 2.60 kilojoules per mole. And so to note down here, some, I mentioned this here, but this is important saying again, the value and sign, positive or negative, for delta G depends on the pressures or concentrations of the, the reactants and products, so Q, as well as the temperature. So here's our example. Um, we're told that the initial pressure of hydrogen iodide gas, that equation we were just looking at down here, um, is one atmosphere, and hydrogen iodine are both at three atmospheres. You know, We just stick them in there, and they start out at those pressures is the reaction spontaneous at 25 Celsius. And then what if we change the initial pressures? Hydrogen iodide now is three atmospheres and hydrogen and iodine are both one. Um, is that spontaneous? So here we go. We're gonna basically, we're gonna plug into delta G equals delta G zero plus RT, L, and Q and see if it's negative or positive. So why don't you guys work this out real quick and come on back when you get your answers. Welcome back guys. So here we go. So there's our nice little equation. We know delta G zero, which is this. Q we can calculate. So we're doing the first scenario where the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide is one atmosphere and the other ones are three. So we plug in here and we get about 0.11 for Q. So there's our delta G zero plus R T L N Q. Look at um, R real quick, guys. Most of the time when we look up and we deal with um, delta G's, delta G zeros, um, we're given units of kilojoules per mole, kilojoules. R, the gas constant we're used to using is 8.3145 joules per Kelvin mole. So what I've done is I've divided by a thousand, you know, one kilojoule per thousand joules, and I got it in this form just so that the units work out. You gotta be careful because if you forget to do that, then this term here um, become, looks like it's more important than it really is and you get wrong answers, right? So anyway, plugging that in, I get 
2.60 here minus this is a number less than one um, so it's going to be natural log that's going to be negative we get negative 5.4 kilojoules per mole and we get delta g is negative 2.8 kilojoules per mole the temperature is because we're told it's 25 celsius so 273.15 plus 25 is 298 and we see that at 25 celsius this process is spontaneous under those initial conditions with the partial pressure of hydrogen iodine is one atmosphere, the others are three. Now let's flip around and do the other scenario. The difference, only difference here guys, same temperature and all that, is that now the partial pressure of hydrogen iodine in the product is three atmospheres and hydrogen and iodine are both starting out at one atmospheres, atmosphere. So we plug into Q and we get Q is 9.0, two sig figs. Same, looks the same, difference is natural log of Q over here. Um, and now we see that delta G is positive 8.0 kilojoules per mole. Um, and so the important thing here is that a positive delta G means it's not spontaneous under those conditions. And so now it's, it's not spontaneous. Um, so large positive delta G means it's likely to go back the other way. So what is true with under these conditions is that the opposite direction will be spontaneous. So let's, let's go back and look at that. So <clears throat> if delta G, not delta G zero, but delta G is negative, then it's uh, spontaneous in the forward direction. If delta G under these conditions is positive, then this is spontaneous in the, in the opposite direction. Now notice, you know, delta G zero is positive, so that's not spontaneous under standard conditions, but it is spontaneous under these conditions here, um, but again, not under these conditions. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at our, our equation. So delta G equals delta G zero plus RT ln Q. Now, when we are at equilibrium, we can say two things. First, delta G, not delta G zero, but delta G itself is equal to zero. That's an, an equilibrium condition. That means zero is equal to this, or delta G zero equals negative RT ln Q. But if we're at equilibrium, Q is equal to K. So if delta G is zero and Q is equal to K, we get zero equals delta G zero plus RT ln K, or delta G zero equals negative RT ln K. This is nice, okay? Um, we can, it's real easy to find, for example, the equilibrium constant at some temperature for our process if we can find delta G zero, which usually we can by, or calculate it by looking up delta G zero formation for the reactants and products. Or if we don't know some, you know, one part of the delta G zero, um, and we do know K, which we can, we've done an equilibrium experiments we've, where we've determined this, so we can find, and we can do an experiment, determine um, the equilibrium constant K at some temperature, and find, calculate, pretty easily delta G zero, it's pretty nice. So um, this, this graph down here just really shows you kind of what's happening. Um, this is the G zero of the reactants, the Gibbs free energy under standard conditions of the reactants, and the products in the left graph here is when delta G zero is positive because the products have a higher Gibbs free energy than the reactants. So the minimum on the, of this curve, so this is, oh, this is a extent of reaction. So on the left here on the X axis, it's before the reaction happens. On the right, it's at the end of the reaction. And this is as it progresses through the reaction, through time. So the minimum of this curve, that's, that's the minimum um, for, for this curve. That's where we're at equilibrium. Right at this point here, Q is equal to K, and delta G, not delta G zero, is equal to zero. Um, before, we, you know, going from left to right, before we get to the this point right here, it's gonna wanna go, down this way, so that means that Q is less than K, um, delta G zero is less than zero, it's going to happen in the direction written until we get here. If we start out over here, the opposite is true, it's going to want to come down this way. Q is greater than K, that means it's going to go back to the left this way, and delta G zero is positive, it's not spontaneous in the direction written. And this is just the opposite for a negative delta G zero. Here the Gibbs free energy of the products is less than Gibbs free energy of the reactants and you know, kind of the reverse um, down here, really. Um, so on this side over here, um, Q is less than K. It's gonna um, shift to the right until we get to this point. Delta G zero is less than zero, and the opposite over here. 
All right, but this equation right here, delta G0 equals minus RTL and K, write that down, guys. That is a very important equation, too. It's really nice. We'll use it. Okay, last thing here to talk about, and by no means the, um, the least, though, free energy and work. One thing that gives free energy, the delta G for a process tells us, and this is a, extremely useful, for, particularly for engineering, but, but not just engineering, it, delta G is the maximum, a maximum useful work that can be done by a system during a spontaneous process at constant temperature and pressure. So the very most work we can do, remember work is force times the distance, and work is what, what we do, right? We want to drive a car, right? So we have to do work to push that car down the road. Um, you know, we want to lift, lift some, some, we want to pump some water up to the top of a tower. We have to do work, right? So how much work can we get out of whatever chemical process we're using to, to, to do that work? This tells us a theoretical limit on it. A real limit, it's not theoretical, it's true. Um, it's a maximum amount of work. This tells us, if we can calculate delta G for a process, we know the maximum amount of work we can do by a system for a spontaneous process. Right? So we burn some fuel, calculate delta G for that, that reaction, we know how much work we can do. Now, a couple things here. Delta G is also the minimum work that must be done to a system, not done by it, but to it. The minimum amount in order to make, an, if it's not spontaneous, to make it happen. So we can force a, 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 a process that's, that's not um, spontaneous to happen um, if we um, do work on it. We can do that. And this is how much work at least we have to do. Same idea. Important. This, look, this is important too, guys. Write this one down. Um, <clears throat> now, up here, when we say the maximum useful work, this is a limit. And the maximum amount of work we can never actually do. This can be only done for what's called a reversible process. And that, that is, a reversible process is, is one where, we, where it happens with an infinite number of steps. Right? And each step can go in the reverse direction just as easily as spontaneously as in the forward direction. Now there is no such thing as a reversible process, but it is a, um, it's a theoretical construct that um, gives us our limit. Um, so because nothing, can, no, because a real process is irreversible, it does not happen in an infinite number of steps. It happens in some finite number of steps, and each of those steps cannot go backwards and forwards um, with the same um, degree of probability. Um, you know, every real process is irreversible. But what this does is this gives us our limit, the maximum amount of work we can do. And that's a really nice thing to know. And that's all there is to Gibbs free energy, guys.